Uh, our next uh, panel, though, is uh, a group of folks who are uh, consuming all this open source. So we'll probably have a good uh, perspective from, hey, we're bringing this open source in, we're using it to uh, build uh, real systems and uh, use in, in mission critical production work, uh, and uh, really can provide that uh, pers different perspective, not from a supplier of open source, but really from uh, large consumers of uh, open source. And I'd like to invite uh, the uh, panelists uh, up on stage. I'll uh, bring you all up and then introduce you one by one, but uh, please come on up. Where did Justin go? Oh, there he is. All right. Go ahead and have a seat. So we have uh, Sabu Alamaraju, uh, VP of Technology uh, at uh, Expedia. So you lead uh, Expedia's uh, cloud migration and enterprise data center, uh, all the public cloud work that you're doing. That's a humongous job. Uh, Niti Gupa is with uh, the, the SVP of Technology at Hired. How many people here know Hired? Oh, we got to change that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like the change Very healthcare cute. guy yesterday. He's like, ah, you know, we do like two thirds of the healthcare financial transactions in the U.S., but uh, we have terrible marketing. <laughs> uh, I think Hired has better marketing on the front. Uh, and then Justin Dean, uh, who works at uh, a company I believe most people know, uh, I end, uh, end up hitting that refresh button constantly <laughs> on Ticketmaster uh, to get uh, good tickets to, to my favorite concerts. But uh, welcome uh, all of you. Thank so, you. Um, so. You all uh, clearly are using uh, open source, as uh, Patrick mentioned. You know, more and more uh, systems are based on open source. It's, it's, it's sort of one. But tell us about you know what are some of the key open source technologies that you're seeing used in your stacks. You know, what what are you bringing in these days to you know move towards this sort of DevOps movement and, and so forth? I, and maybe we'll start on that end, just because we always start on this side and. We'll come back. Yeah, I mean, um, Ticketmaster at its core is, you know, we've been open source since the beginning. Well, I say the beginning. We're a 41-year-old company, which a lot of people don't realize. But uh, the culture has been very, very DIY. Um, we, you know, we're fa our founders built the nucleus of the ticketing engine, you know, um, in 1978. Um, some of that software we still run, <laughs> um, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, but you know, the, the, the culture has been very DIY. So that led into open source naturally. So we use probably almost all of the projects out there in some way, shape, or form. Um, but you know, the, the core of it in my world and the technical operations and our cloud and infrastructure spaces, um, Kubernetes and containers is all the rage for the last two years-ish. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's, it's really changing the, the landscape for us because we're using our container movement um, as a catalyst to improve software across the company, you know, in all aspects of it. So, um, you know, all of the, all of the, the, you know, we're using these technologies that, that uh, not just from a cloud computing perspective, but from a, um, let's deep dive into every one of our applications and, and uh, do the work of cracking open the code and making it um, more modern and really up-leveling on all, uh, all fronts in order to get it to run into a container and then to get it to run into Kubernetes in a public cloud space, it has to be pretty good, right? It has to be instrumented and all. And, um, so we're, we're sort of using it as the catalyst for an entire movement yeah. um, on top of the, the open source projects that are, are you know, improving and becoming enterprise grade. Yeah, Niti, it's, it seems like, you know, trying to figure out uh, what the right abstraction layers are to, to build these platforms is so difficult. You know, is it VMs, is it PaaS, is it containers, is it, you know, which application framework? <laughs> it just seems like that is such a tricky thing to figure out. And you, know, you, you, know, you want it to be maintained long-term, you want it to be sustainable. You know, what, what are you seeing? You know, what are those abstractions? What are those platforms? What is that that you're uh, deploying? Yeah, I mean, I think our tactics, so let me just begin by introducing Hired, since most of you don't know Hired. Uh, actually, even before that, happy International Women's Day, everybody. Uh, the, so Hired is, uh, is an application that's purely built on open source. Uh, we have, we're not just a web application, uh, a mobile application. But in addition to that, we have a fairly sophisticated machine learning algorithm that presents job opportunities for highly skilled tech workers. Uh, as we've grown our infrastructure and as we've grown our solution, our tact is pretty much like what Justin said. It's about finding the right tool for the right job. 
We are based in San Francisco, highest, you know, it's a very, very costly market. Uh, for a startup that's getting off the ground, uh, especially in this environment, which is so highly competitive, uh, we are very, very cognizant of our human cost, and we're also very cognizant of our time to market. So because of that, we don't have the luxury. We were not like born 40 years ago. Uh, and the ecosystem was very different. I started my career at Bell Labs where we had an NIH syndrome where you know, we had to invent everything at, within the confines of Bell Labs. And that's completely and utterly changed. Yeah. So for us, our approach is not about figuring out the different layers, even as we invested in machine learning and figured out what algorithms we should be using. We first go seek those solutions if somebody solved them, only and, and then we enhance and build on top of them. There are very, very few cases where we have to sort of start from scratch, um, if you will. So our primary motivation and driver in making these decisions is around cost and time to market. Interesting. How about at Expedia? What are you seeing? What's uh, the staff? I think I actually echo some of the Nidhi's comments on uh, do it yourself versus open source. I worked at, uh, before joining Expedia to lead cloud migration, I was at eBay building eBay's infrastructure, private cloud infrastructure for four years. And, and we embraced open source. In fact, we were, at the time, one of the largest uh, successful stories of OpenStack, adopters of OpenStack at eBay. And subsequently, the team moved on to Kubernetes and it's open source, Docker, Mesos. They were all uh, uh, ingrained in the culture. And, and we do have similar mentality of, of uh, embracing open source, being open, uh, sharing, all that stuff. But what I see happening is that uh, uh, as cloud has, uh, the serviceification of, 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 of uh, problems has been growing very rapidly in the last few years. In, I think from 2011, 12 onwards until now, you have a massive warehouse scale services offering uh, very so solving really interesting problems that we were able, not able to solve as quickly in the data center. So that has changed uh, from open source to a bit closed source because I don't know how this service called Kinesis works, but it's solving a problem. Right. So that is influencing how we are thinking about uh, this open source in, uh, in quotes because we have to take advantage of what exists there so we can invest in our time and money in where our business goes. Yeah. So and that's the change I'm seeing uh, over the last several years. I uh, actually what yeah. Nidhi is supporting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we saw that yesterday you know, in the serverless conversation. Mm -hmm. This, uh, you know, avoid lock-in, mm -hmm. you know, solves a super fast right, problem. Right, right. Like, I, I'd be curious to hear what, what, what did the three of you like, where do you land on this pendulum? Because I think those are tough decisions because it's so tempting to just say, I got to get to market and yeah. just take that. And then five years later, you're like, wow, this is getting expensive. Well, yeah. You know. and, and, um, uh, from, from the Ticketmaster's perspective, um, you know, it, it's, there's an interesting uh, dynamic that happens when you know, at, at a large company with lots of diversity of our product space and different teams and, you know, um, and, and different cycle, like where they're at in the maturity of their, their particular product that they're working on. Um, we have a lot of aspirations, like, hey, we're going to go and do whatever the, the thing is, right? We're going to be all Kubernetes by next year. And then reality hits, and then you realize, you know, there's, a, there's an entire spectrum of, of these different teams. So... Some of them take you know, it, all the advantage of something new, a server, serverless technology, and if, they, if it fits within, um, if it helps them either by speed, agility, or some reason, deliver some business function, um, and it's worth doing that, that's not in the vanilla suite of sort of a corporate offering type of a thing, um, then we encourage it, you know, go do that, because there's some ROI that's important but we try to be eyes wide open across the company that says, by doing that, we not, you, know, you may not get centralized support on all these things that are uh, fairly, you know, we can't support all Earth's technologies, right? So, um, but we, we've, we've learned that, you know, standard, standardize on the things that make, you know, the core bread and butter things, but definitely allow teams to operate like many micro businesses and they have their own drivers and motivations and uh, being, having an open mind to that is, you know, it works really well for us. On the flip side, it's challenging a little bit because it's easier when everything is one thing, right? 
yeah. use this cloud and the, here's the rules and here's the menu in an Outburger menu, right? It's just not super practical for large scaled out companies that have probably a diverse business portfolio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think to the point that the, the specifically the lock-in point, Yeah. Lock-in can happen regardless of whether you're using open source or closed source, right? So at some point, um, if you hold back on avoiding lock-in, you're going to sacrifice efficiency. You're going to sacrifice, there's a cost component to it. Uh, and no matter how much you try to avoid that lock-in, even if you sacrifice efficiency and then you incur additional cost, you still will not be able to. So. My, our personal point of view is go all in, and if you need to change down the road, you change down the road. Okay. Yeah. Can I make one comment real quick? Sure. Yeah, yeah. comment? So I would, I would, since we did have a, a DIY spirit, like so we built our own cloud 10 years ago, and like it's really, really uh, useful for developers. It's, it's easy to use and all that. I would argue that we've built the most lock-in machine in our private cloud that is really yeah. challenging. You're locked into so yourself. You can literally lock it, and then you have to staff it, you know, so it's, yeah. it's challenging. So it, it doesn't just go on the vendor side of Correct. things, it's you could lock into your own stuff. Right, sure. absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Or you, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, I think the moment you pick something, build some tools around it, build some operating procedures around it, um, and culture around it, you're locked into it. Yep. Whether you, that is an open source software or a closed source appliance or a cloud service, lock-in is here to stay. It's part of our, uh, it's actually a cultural uh, artifact because I do believe that the process of maintain, the, the act of maintaining change, uh, having the culture to, yes, we can change anytime we need to change. I think that is for much more important than but then the fear-driven mindset of, okay, I don't want to embrace X product because that X is closed source. I don't like that vendor. He might mess my things in future. That's fear-driven approach. I would definitely not take that fear-driven approach. Instead, I would look at the opportunities that exist for me, for my business, for my customers, and go after those. Yeah. And in the lock-in is a process I have to deal with it. Yep. All the time. Yeah, it's funny because you know I, I, on Tuesday, I kept saying like it, the these black and white, like lock-in versus not lock-in. It, we're, we're past this. Now it's this degree of subtlety of managing yeah. risk somewhere on that spectrum, which is, is, is exactly. what you're all, all talking about. And that yeah. subtlety truly matters. Yeah. Uh, the, what's interesting to me, though, in terms of uh, you three being here is, you know, we have a lot of folks in the audience that work at uh, companies who build uh, commercial implementations of a lot of open source, right? And that could be intentional as a pure kind of open source based startup, or it could be just because, hey, we got to get to market fast and our products just so happen to use a lot of open source components to, to do that. But, uh, and so they have program offices, they have people inside of the company who uh, manage the intellectual property sharing, that uh, work to tool the development process to pull code in, modify, share back rules, so on and so forth. And we hadn't seen that as much in you know, what you all represent, which, which is not necessarily, you, know, you, you obviously have a service you're providing, but what we think much more of as end user, uh, these type of groups being formed. What, what, in each of your companies, do, do you have like, the, you know, these policies? Are you building competency? Is it something you build right into the engineering team? Like how do you approach open source in your firms? Yeah. Like I'll start over there. Um, so I, it, it's interesting because it, one of the first things I noticed being here um, and talking to people, and on day one, I, I sort of had a little bit of uh, open source FOMO, maybe. I was like, you know, everyone has these open source program offices, and, and we don't have that. Um, and part of me is, you know, going and rationalizing, like, well, because in our DNA, but then part of me is like, well, we're probably missing the boat a little bit on, like, doing oh, it are. in a structured way. Um, but you know, we we, we definitely um, encourage in just the, the fabric of our engineering culture. Um, obviously, using open source and but but contributing as well. Yeah. And part of it is we want the highest caliber talent working at the company, and we want them to be happy and excited about what they do, and we want them to be part of the open source community. And n normally, that's where we find them and we recruit them. So they're naturally inclined to want to participate in that, and then we support it in every level that we can possibly do. Um, everything from you know, actually committing to upstream projects, uh, you know, as well as supporting 
sending people around and talking about stuff, which, you know, if you go back a few years ago, you wouldn't see a, a Ticketmaster standing on stage talking about things that they're doing, right? Because we're super secretive and keep it all locked down, right? So we're we're changing how we think about um, the the value we provide as a company, and it's not our secrets, right? It's it's what we provide in the platforms that we we offer, yeah. And it's it, there's almost an inter interesting corollary. Uh, as a company, we're opening up our platform, meaning not the people who own all the ticketing inventory, but now we're becoming a platform for a marketplace, essentially. Right. So there's almost this, this uh, company-level open source mentality that's, that's happening and permeating. So it's, it, um, it, it, yeah, so I, it, the, the takeaway that I have from this week is to really start investigating, you know, do we need an open source office to, to take advantage of some of the work that I'm seeing a lot of folks in the audience do and put a little more structure and rigor behind it because we probably can uh, increase our horsepower and velocity and contribute more. Yeah, interesting. How about at Hired? So some of the some of the things we do in terms of adoption is so our uh, our application is built using Ruby uh, and Rails. So there's a there's a fairly large community. Uh, of gems, uh, community support around gems that's available. So for anything new that we're looking at, we, we first scour to look for any gems that we can just adopt. In terms of contributing back into the community, because so much, I mean, literally, we could, I could count on my fingertips of things that are not open source in our infrastructure. So given that, uh, we sort of make a conscious effort to contribute back uh, into the pool. Some of the rigor and process that we've introduced, which has been very interesting, is um, as part of an engineer's growth ladder, uh, one of the, as they become, as they grow in their career, they need to, there's a leadership aspect, uh, regardless of whether they're on the management track or not. As an IC, there's a, there's a leadership aspect and there's a community aspect. And that community aspect is giving back to the community that you've, you've gained so much benefit from. So that's been helping. Yeah, I think we, we take a similar approach. In fact, I was uh, thinking, like Justin was thinking, like we don't have an office, program office, but we are practicing learning. We are practicing sharing. We encourage, mm -hmm. in fact, one of the norms we set for our engineers, uh, like you had talked about, is that uh, learning and sharing are part of uh, your, your norms we expect each in engineer to adhere to. Right. So you cannot say, I won't share, I won't talk. You're, we expect you to do that as part of exhibiting growth mindset, taking feedback from others, and leveraging. So we always question like, well, yes, you are doing this problem, but are you leveraging something that exists in a different team? We try to look for that to an extent, uh, as long as it doesn't impede that person's uh, uh, drive to do th things on his own, because there are teams that want to do it, and we don't stop that. Yeah. But I think more important, the leadership aspect is, uh, are you able to, uh, as, you, as you grow as an engineer or individual, are you able to promote these behaviors, learning and sharing and, and, and demonstrating? We do encourage contributions uh, in open source, but we don't have a program office as such. And actually learning from others uh, uh, and what, how they approach that problem. Yeah, I mean, because you know, the question I have is, it, 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 what I hear a lot, you, know, you heard this from Home Depot yesterday, right? You know, very traditional company. And I think they said four or five times on stage in their keynote, a, we're hiring. B, we love open source developers. Did we mention we're hiring? We love open source. <laughs> we're hiring. Open source developers are awesome. Right? I mean, clearly that is a huge motivation to let your employees go work in these communities because that's what they want. That motivates them. That helps you and so forth. What, what are some of the, the but, but then I talk to, let's say, a financial services uh, company that will say, whoa, 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 we're not, we're regulated, we're not sharing. What are some of the road, can you give some examples of road bumps that you've had in terms of, you know, we don't, we're not quite sure how to share, we have white and black lists of licenses, or we're not, we don't know how to pick projects. What, what are things that you struggle with that maybe this community can help you with? Mm -hmm. So I can speak for us um, exactly the example that you gave. Um, as, we, um, as we get larger enterprises, especially banks, on our platform, um, they get scared. They get scared. They ask for a disclosure on when we get the infosec requests. You know, they ask about open source software, hmm. and you know, sometimes they ask for us to share the list of open source. And you know, that list is 
really, really massive. Do, do, you, do you have a good list? I won't put you. We actually do have oh, a good list. Go. Yes, <laughs> we use this tool. We use this gem, uh, <laughs> thanks to the Ruby ecosystem, uh, that actually discovers it and also actually very easily dis, uh, picks up as to what the licenses are uh, as well. But um, but yeah, it's a, it's a big challenge in terms of not just educating our customers, but also their legal teams and their security consultants that, you know, as to the, pro the process with which we've gone through in terms of, through which we've gone through in terms of evaluation. Um, we have this constant conversation with our legal, um, right? Thankfully, over the last several years, legal is sort of catching up. So um, several years ago, it was it was a huge struggle mm. uh, in working with our legal department. But I think I think I think the industry is catching up. Yeah, I, I, I would I would uh, say we're in a similar boat. Um, the the thing that I think uh, I guess the biggest unlock for us in that space was is starting to educate the folks in the company who manage those risks, like our legal, our uh, PR teams, like those are the two big, big ones to get anything done or approved. Mm. And the closer they are to understanding the value of um, being a company that is embracing and adopting and contributing back in an open source community, the, the more they can um, help enable us to do things and approve things versus just look at the risk side, right? Because there's, there's not a lot of upside when you send an email and say, hey, we're thinking about doing this thing. Can you approve this? And it's just, you know, some legal doc, their, their default is no, right? Like, why would I do this? Mm. Hey, it, this is why we're doing this and encouraging this. And, and then if you get them connected to the financials of it, right? Like, hey, we're, we're, we're trying to recruit, just as a basic ex example, right? Recruiting costs a lot of money, right? And we need top talent to do blah, blah, blah. So if you can somehow tie it to, this is super beneficial and important for us, and we need you to help us be an advocate to sign the papers or you know, disclose, you know, whatever it needs, needs to yeah. happen so that it doesn't get stop, stock, uh, stopped in sort of like email um, you know, risk and or I don't really know. And you know, yeah. definitely in the I don't know. I've had a lot of those. It's something that should take two days, takes two months, because no one's comfortable just putting their name on it because they're mm -hmm. confused. Yeah. So, but uh, Sabi, you've been through you know, generations of, of sort of you know, OpenStack to Mesa to, to Kubernetes and, and sort of what, what were the, did you experience similar roadblocks where like, whoa, we're going to rebase our platform on this thing and legal risk or like, what, what challenges did you see going through that process? We actually were fortunate. We did not uh, go, I did not go through the roadblocks in terms of con using open source, adopting open source and operating at a larger scale because we actually benefited a lot from that community and we were able to scale introduced tremendous financial and agility gains for the companies. So that was positive. I think the roadblocks are sort of subtle roadblocks that, that I have seen in my career in, in every company I worked for, because not every engineer uh, is willing to stand up and say, yes, I have this small contribution. I'm going to make it. Tell me how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes, the, there is reluctance. Oh, now I have to do this. Why do I do this? So that culture mind shift is still happening. Has to ha is, teams are going through that. Yeah. I think there's a lot more mentoring and, and uh, this practice of growth minds that needs to continue so that you're sharing and you're encouraged to share, you become more comfortable sharing. A lot of us still have the discomfort. Oh, I need to commit. Now it's part of my resume. And, and is it that they're too busy to say like, ah, you know, I'm al you're already, I'm already working so much. Now I got to go commit this thing to a project and they're going to give me a hard time and they might not like my code. Do, do you experience this a lot? Like, there is that. There is yeah. certainly some of that because teams are, in every company I work for, there's a lot more work to do than the number of team, the number of people that have to do the work. Sure. I think that is probably playing a bit of role. So uh, I've seen, uh, unless you have a dedicated effort to reward teams, uh, to encourage the practices, show them how to do it, I don't think it's naturally going to happen. In the so, so I'd love to get your all three of your advice on you know one of the things we said early on uh, this week is how do you how can you be a really good upstream for this kind of downstream cons, you know consumption and one thing I just heard is like man if you make it hard for me to go submit patches and you're put you know raking us over the coals all the time or it's an unclear process probably not going to get that code back and starts to kind of deteriorate. Well, what are, what are things you would advise upstreams you, to, to do? Um, you know, so one of the things that's worked really well um, is 
You know, when we, when we started down our Kubernetes journey, um, one of the things that we did immediately was realized, hey, we, we do not have the you know, talent internally to really say that it, we can operate it at scale, production grade. So we partnered with uh, CoreOS. And through that, that partnership, we've jointly um, built things that were very specific to an enterprise, like so, things like um, detailed uh, cost and chargeback inside of Kubernetes itself. Right, so things that, that probably the upstream doesn't really deal with, but for me, I have to build this stuff back. It, you know, yeah. a million internal users. So we work with their product teams, and we come up with, hey, they're you know, sketched out what to build, and then we jointly build it, and then they they helped us push it back upstream. Those sort of things. Yeah. And it, because they know better, you know, how to get something back upstream than we do, or one of a, an engineer who doesn't do that professionally all the time, but. It was just like this support harness that we, we you partner with with companies that have a vested interest, and it makes it easier for us to jointly solve these problems, and and they take some of the friction out of it for us. So I, I thought this was a really good um, uh, example of of how to take a company who's we have all the problems that that you know a lot of the the, the upstreams don't deal with, so we have a lot of knowledge and, and we can offer that and some hands on keyboard horsepower. Um, and then they have the knowledge of how to get it in, up, upstream. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you, you, you know, in any user-driven innovation cycle, the, the end user requirements are obviously critical to this. And, you know, a, a developer, you know, maybe working in isolation isn't going to see the scaling problems and the, you know, that you gave a billing example that, you know, you would. But what you're saying, and I think we all talk about, is that having a upstream that has a support ecosystem of organizations that can act as you know, essentially commercial intermediaries to that project is highly valuable. Do you look for that, Nidia? We don't, we don't necessarily look for commercial intermediaries, but we do look for, uh, we do look for um, open source software that's well supported and has a community support behind it. But is that supported in a commercial sense in that like oh, there's 10 vendors there or is it? May or like, may not. Okay. Right, so it depends. So uh -huh. for really large pieces of infrastructure, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a backup option, right? We may or may not call upon that commercial, uh, that support infrastructure, but we know that that, that option exists. Yeah. But as it pertains to smaller pieces of software like GEMS, we don't look for commercial support. We primarily look for look to make sure that you know, again, tying, like tying to this previous, previous previous conversation around security and making sure malicious software doesn't get into our infrastructure, mm -hmm. is making sure there's a history of changes. Uh, there's a good, a fair bit of uh, community support around there, uh, around those gems, and making sure that um, this is not just something one developer sitting somewhere has just shipped. Uh, you know, there's like a, there's a few people who have been supporting it for a period of time. So it's hybrid for us. Yeah. yeah I think going back to the question you asked, I think uh, what I look for in Office team, uh, based on my experience in infrastructure open source projects like Kubernetes, OpenStack, and Mesos. I think in the community, we tend to underestimate what it takes to run uh, any software at scale. There is a service aspect that we sort of miss uh, in, the, in the way we architect and build systems. Uh, I remember uh, uh, when, I, when I was doing an OpenStack, the number of, con we had about 30 engineers, I remember, I think uh, the number of contributions we made to upstream was handful. Mm -hmm. Where our time was spent is in actually operating the software at, at a certain scale, and we were increasing the scale systematically month after month after month, and that took a lot of work. And I think we tend to underestimate what it takes to run software. Yeah. And, and I think operational operability is, is a fairly complicated task, and, and that's where I feel that the cloud is winning, and open source, when you compete on the same terms, like the same feature, open source versus a cloud provider, the cloud provider is winning because they're able to focus on automation, automation and operability much more than the community is able to. And there is that, we have to consider that a lot. I, I, I do feel that it's time coming, we're coming to a point where the community probably needs to move up, up a bit on the stack. Don't try to solve the same problems. Yeah. Don't try to solve Kubernetes problems. Don't decide to solve um, infrastructure problems. Move up. Yeah. Then you can create more innovation and let the providers operate the service and they can add more value to, yeah. to us. Yeah, I think one thing that's always been interesting is that there's eth this ethos of scratch your own itch, right? Like if you come to me with a requirement as an open source project, you better come with code, right? And uh, I think Greg 
Crow Hartman from uh, the Linux community and, and Linus and I have had these conversations where, you know, years ago, um, I would say to them, you know, hey, you know, these banks, they're all using Linux and, you know, they're, we're not getting them to come and give code and scratch their own itch. And surprisingly, these guys saying back to me, we'll just take the requirements. Like, we're just not operating those environments, right? We, we really want to understand. And so it sounds like, you know, just projects that have a healthier way of at least just even hearing you, mm -hmm. um, even if it's not directly with code, it is, is something that, that you value there. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I, I, I want to give a uh, last word on uh, the, the security topic uh, that, that you just heard. Um, you know, this is something that I think we're just all going to have to deal with and live with and, and improve, and we're at the beginning of a long journey of, of how to fix that. What, what, what is your perspective on some of the concerns that Patrick raised, which is, you know, oh my gosh, this may, is this stuff more or less secure and whatnot? What, what, what are your perspectives? I think, uh, I actually touch, touch upon one point, and I do agree with uh, Patrick that I think it's time to move on from whether it's multiple ISOs looking at the source versus proprietary. I think what I'm seeing as a bigger, a bigger challenge uh, in corporations is that in the last five, 10 years, we have sort of broken the walls between dev and ops. Yeah. So there's more feedback, there's more awareness of what happens in the site when things go wrong. So that feedback loop helped engineers to build better systems. That's happening, very healthy uh, trend, I see that. But when it comes to security, it's not so, because teams don't understand what security is doing, and security sort of has this glass house mentality. We are in the ivory tower, we tell you what not to do, but we don't tell you why, we don't educate you. So there is that culture gap a lot, and, and consequently teams don't make mistakes because they don't understand what the risk vectors are. Hmm. I think that DevSecOps uh, model where it's not just about tools, it's about the culture. How do you incorporate this mentality into your, your way of thinking, your way of doing, so you're aware of, you make better choices, you teach each other, yeah. and that's neat, that needs to happen. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting time for security for everyone, right? Like, because it's now in vogue, it's now a topic, it's now on the daily news. Like, it, it's a thing, like, that more than it used to be, even though it's, you know, the, the landscape hasn't changed, we're talking about it now. Um, and so, you know, we're, we are constantly reevaluating, you know, our practices, procedures, the culture around security, you know, it, it, within the company. Um, I'm finding now it's a little easier to reevaluate because usually reevaluate probably means you spend more money on it to some level, but now um, the company uh, it puts it as a number one priority. Mm. Clearly, right at the at the C-suite is security's number one. Whatever we need to do to do it correctly, um, which makes it a lot easier, right, than it was say two years ago. Say, you know, um, so that's giving us the bandwidth and, and the resources to really invest in in uh, the tools the. Uh, the teams, the, put the right policies and procedures in place. Um, so it, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's a constant evolution, I would say. And, you know, we're, we, we border the, the, the different aspects of, of you know, it's security is everyone's job, but then do you have people that are security in their title? And, and balancing that, right? So you have to have the security team that has security in their title to enable and teach and, and get the, requirements that you expect out of all of your engineers or all of your developers um, so that they know what to do and they, and yeah. they know if they're winning or not. Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, for us, it's just a constant focus of ensuring that we're continuing to double down. Yeah. Mm, I think uh, similar to what Subhu said, uh, I 100% agree. We've sort of broken down the walls between dev and DevOps, but performance and security are two categories that are still an afterthought. Hmm. Right, so we ha we had hired have a very sophisticated CI/CD engine. We don't have, we hardly have any tech ops staff. We hardly have, we don't have any QA. Uh, we've automated the heck out of our pipeline. We're now starting conversations about not just functionality, but also plugging in tools in the right places to make sure that in our CI/CD pipeline, we're measuring for performance and security. Hmm. Today we evaluate it in production. There are third parties. There's third-party software that's running, uh, that's evaluating it. But you know, to what Patrick said, we need to put that in place in our CI/CD pipeline. Uh, what I hear is unanimous consensus here on DevSecOps. Like, 
I thought Absolutely. we were just talking about DevOps the other day. Yeah. Like that was a new thing. <laughs> There's Clearly, the, already it's ruined. <laughs> one of the dynamics of, like, around that, right, is, is, so I like to say that we DevOps hard over the last like three yeah. years or so, and, and, and we're delivering product to market at crazy fast speeds compared to what we used to be. But we, part of that uh, evolution is putting control and autonomy out to the edges, right, to thousands of developers. And then when you start the security conversation, it's usually the mindset is, well, we need to centralize the control. Right. So it's like, where is the control? And, and yeah. when you give autonomy, you have to give accountability, responsibility with it. Right? You don't get autonomy without those. And that's where the DevOps stuff got a, a little off the rails, I think, for most companies. It's here's the, here's the autonomy without the, the rigor behind it. All right, so next year, we heard, <laughs> all week I've been hearing security is everybody's responsibility, <laughs> DevSecOps, we have to integrate this in the process, we have to have a culture around this. I mean, next year, let's check in on how much progress we've made on actually uh, mm -hmm. doing that. I think that would be a, an interesting thing in retrospect yeah. to look yeah. back <laughs> on. So I want to thank all of you for coming and sharing your insights, uh, and let's give them a quick round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.